session is tailored uh this session is tailored for educational professionals seeking to develop and grow in the dynamic landscapes of Southeast Asia and Latin America. My name is Rebecca Bendel, and I'm the Director of Partnerships Development for Acumen, part of the SANMS4 group. And over the next 45 minutes, you guys are getting a 15 minute early mark. I'll be drawing on our expert panelists to provide you with essential strategies and tactics vital for navigating and excelling in these regions. We have quite a diverse audience representing over 14 countries here today, and I'm encouraging you all to submit your questions by the Q&A, and I will do my very best to answer them as they come through. So to begin, I'd like to introduce you to our experts. First of all, Heike Manning. He is the Executive Director for Southeast Asia for Acumen and the former New Zealand Ambassador to Vietnam. He has more than 20 years of ex extensive international experience, including over 12 years living and working across Asia. As a former diplomat and a business owner, he has a deep blend of government, trade and commercial experience combined with legal background. After completing his, his ambassadorship in Vietnam, Hiker established Lightpath Consulting Group in Ho Chi Minh City, a B2B consulting company specialised in international education, supporting international education providers wanting to engage in Vietnam. The Vietnamese government has awarded Heike the official medal for the cause of education in recognition of his efforts to promote international education within Vietnam. Based in Ho Chi Minh City, Heike's role is to lead Acumen's expansion in the high potential, fast growing Southeast Asia region. Welcome, Heike. Simon Terrington is the director and founder of Edco Latam Consulting and has over 23 years of experience working in the international higher education field. He has worked in senior roles in both the public and private sector. Between 2009 and 2022, Simon lived and worked in Colombia, initially co-founding co and managing an agency and then working as the TAM Regional Director at Into University Partnerships for four years. In 2019, Simon, along with Jamie Ash, set up Edco Latam Consulting, which support educational institutions reach their student recruitment and engagement goals from Latin America. Edco Latam currently works with 17 partners situated in Australia, Canada, France, and the UK on regional representation and consulting projects. Edco has a team of professionals based in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and the UK. So, right, let's get straight into the questions. Simon, tell me why your market of expertise is emerging. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Bex. So I've come up with three key reasons as to why Latin America has great potential for, for institutions. The first one is the growing middle class. And um, this is uh, effectively, um, you know, many more um, parents have a propensity to pay. Um, the incomes are rising across the continent. And that, of course, means that um, there's a lot more demand. The second would be increase in English language ability. Um, certainly I noticed from my time in Latin America from 2009 to 2022, there was a distinct kind of difference between English language uh, level abilities across the region. And this was, um, there's been several government initiatives that have kind of focused on bilingualism, and this has had a definite effect. So there's a lot more kind of ready students, ready as far as English language levels are concerned. And then, of course, a growing interest in undergraduate study, which is actually really interesting because I'm sure many of the audience will know that Latin America, um, you know, traditionally it's been a secondary stroke tertiary market, but actually there's been um, quite a sharp increase in the number of undergraduate students going to study overseas, particularly from, if we look at Brazil, for example, um, a couple of years ago, that was predominantly 75% of students going off to higher education from Brazil um, would, would study postgraduate um, taught subjects, but that's actually changed to about 60% and 40% undergraduate. So this is a trend that is obviously very interesting. Thanks, Simon. And it's good to have those three sharp points. Heike, do you have something similar for Southeast Asia? Yeah, same, same, but but different, Beck. And uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be joining you today. And I can assure you that uh, the uh, choice of clothes that uh, Simon and I have today is purely coincidental. Um, we're obviously of the same vintage. But anyway, um, I, th I think uh, just to sort of pick up on, on, a, on a point, um, that Simon made and sort of a parallel with uh, with this region and and Vietnam where I am in particular, 
Um, last year, I was walking down a uh, street in, uh, in Saigon in District 7, uh, close to RMIT campus. And I was walking down and I saw this English language center and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then 30 meters further down, I saw another English language center. And then another 50 meters down, I saw another English language center. Then I saw a STEM center. And in a 500 meter stretch of, uh, of road, um, I saw 14 uh, English and STEM centers in this one area. Uh, and I was completely struck by this, um, A, because I think it really shows uh, the demand uh, for uh, English language. And uh, as a result, we're seeing rapid improvements in English here as well in, in, in markets such as, um, such as Vietnam. But also it shows an increasing ability to pay by families who are actually investing in, um, in some cases, quite expensive programs uh, to uh, prepare their kids for, uh, for higher education. So um, that was just sort of, I guess, one example, just sort of picking up on what Simon was saying. Um, but I think, you know, when we look at uh, Southeast Asia, I think it, it's it's interesting when we talk about it as being emerging, because, uh, you know, if you asked anyone in Southeast Asia, they'd say, well, we're not emerging, we've always been here. Um, I think um, what's different is, and even institutions as well have been, uh, many have been looking at Southeast Asia and engaging here for many years. But I think what's different is, and, and why it's interesting is, um, firstly, uh, you know, Southeast Asia is changing so quickly and countries within Southeast Asia are, are really, are being transformed. Um, particularly when you look at some of the big uh, populated countries uh, such as Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, what you see is some of the fastest growth rates, economic growth rates and income growth rates uh, in the world. And you also see uh, just rapidly changing economies. And as a result, you also see changes to uh, education and training needs. And so if you take a, take Vietnam, for example, and you look at uh, what the government is saying, and in fact, um, uh, Prime Minister, the Vietnamese Prime Minister was just in Australia this week uh, addressing a, an education forum there. And he was saying, look, you know, Vietnam doesn't need more business graduates. What Vietnam needs is it needs engineers, it needs um, uh, uh, students that are studying STEM subjects, uh, and specifically because they have their eyes on growing a massive uh, semiconductor industry here in Vietnam. And so I think, um, I guess my main message in terms of how we think about and why we would say uh, you know, Southeast Asia is emerging is um, firstly, because nothing stands still and it's always changing. And secondly, there are huge um, opportunities and, and demand across the different countries uh, to actually meet the demands of these countries themselves. Um, so that's why it's super interesting. And I think the final thing as well, just to say, is that obviously, as everyone knows, um, Southeast Asia is incredibly diverse. Um, you've got 700 million people across uh, 10 countries with very different circumstances. So kind of figuring out you know, where to play is, is also a critical uh, part of this as well. Thanks, Heike. Um, it is a very complex market um, and, you know, spending a lot of time on the ground there is, is really important. Now, we've got a lot of... Oh, Beck, uh, your, your mic is all dead. <laughs> Am I back again? Yes. I've got that problem again. Excellent. <laughs> uh, you've, gone, you've gone again. Simon, you're going to have to step in if, if uh, this continues. <laughs> I'm joking. We can't, uh, we can't hear you. Oh, here we go. Then we can hear you now. As I turn my video off, I'll give yeah. it one more go. Let's see how we go. Okay. <laughs> Collaboration awesome. between educational institutions is crucial for success. How can educators initiate and maintain successful collaborations across borders? Additionally, could you share any challenges you've encountered in establishing international education collaborations and how have you overcome them? And look, Heike, I'm going to throw to you first, um, just to let you keep talking about Southeast Asia. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Beck. Um, I think um, just one of the first things, just as a sort of a scene setter for Southeast Asia, when we're talking about uh, institutional collaborations, is that when you look at the um, rankings and, you know, whatever you think about rankings, they're difficult to ignore. Uh, in 2024, Times Higher Education uh, rankings, 33 of the top 200 institutions in the world are now in Asia. Uh, and not just Southeast Asia, but Asia as a whole. Uh, and that number is set to keep on increasing. So 
I think, um, you know, as, as uh, institutions are thinking about how they um, internationalize and how they engage, that's a really important thing to keep in mind that we're seeing rapid improvements uh, in quality uh, across the region. Um, and I think the second thing to sort of set the scene as to why you might collaborate is, um, is that, you know, I think what we're all seeing at the moment is obviously there's quite a lot of pressure um, and some of it's political pressure where you have, um, you know, political pressures from the UK uh, in terms of graduate visas, you've got political pressures in Australia around the migration review. And so thinking about how you can build relationships in order to de-risk and look at different delivery modes uh, in the region is a really sound strategy. Uh, now, having said that, I think, um, you know, in terms of tips and things to think about, uh, if you are looking at these institutional collaborations, um, I think the first thing is, uh, you know, I, I don't think I can stress this enough, the most important thing is finding the right partner. And uh, it sounds really trite to say it, but, you know, so often, uh, you know, these, these institutional partnerships can just sort of spring up because someone sort of popped out of the woodwork or, you know, they've expressed interest and then and then suddenly you're on a, on, a, on a journey together. But really sort of being clear on, uh, you know, on who you should be working with is really important. And part of that is just making sure you've got really good alignment uh, in terms of your objectives. Like, what is it that you're trying to do with a, with a collaboration? Are you looking at branding benefits? Are you looking at commercial returns? Because if you don't have that alignment with your partner, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I think um, one of the other kind of things and, and, and things that I've seen, which is really, really important to get right, is if, if you are doing any sort of commercial arrangements, for example, transfer of students or joint programs, um, the money matters. You absolutely have to nail down the details. And sometimes people don't like talking about money. But um, if you don't talk about money up front, uh, then you can run into some real problems later on. So having those conversations and recording it really clearly, I think, is super important. Um, and then I think um, just a couple of a couple of other th thoughts in terms of you know that sort of collaboration space. Uh, the first one is just you know making sure that you don't just set and forget your partnerships. Um, they require work and nurture, uh, and you know because uh, people move on, um, relationships change, and you need to work at it, and you need to have a mechanism for troubleshooting because if you don't. Um, then uh, all of a sudden you'll find that a partnership once that once worked suddenly doesn't. Um, and the final thing is, I think, um, and and this is based on experience as well. Is I'd suggest that you know you don't need to rush in and do like a you know full hundred percent um, kind of partnership straight away. I think sometimes uh, taking your time and building confidence. You know, maybe starting with uh, faculty exchange and and some progression arrangements or articulation arrangements is a really good way to. to to test, and then you can build from there, and 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 hopefully, you know, the relationship can really blossom from there. Thanks, Heike. We we just recently ran a, a session at the API conference on T and E partnerships, and there was lots of different institutions from around the world, um, and it was really interesting about some of those real fundamentals. And you talked about, you know, making sure that the the senior leadership are on board talking about commercials are really important. So um, really appreciate those points for Southeast Asia. Simon, are there are they, are they similar things when you're looking at LATAM? Yeah, very similar. And thanks, Heike. I mean, I concur with lots of what, um, what Heike kind of said here. The first thing to note in Latin America really is that there's lots of opportunity. There's 3,000 higher education institutions across Latin America, but of course, what we need to do is it's it's all about profile and matching and, and ensuring that that match is a really good fit because in Latin America, these agreements can be fruitful and there's been many examples of T&E partnerships that are working really well, but actually that it can be quite bureaucratic as well to kind of get these agreements signed. And as Heike alluded to as well, it's a question of kind of patience is, is, is one of the key characteristics I think you need in Latin America, but actually... You, the, the agreements once they're signed as i've said they they will become fruitful and will um solicit students and and really good relationships long term and there's several examples of those that we've got within our within our partnership so i would say again really just just the key point here is communication lines and latin america is very personable 
and I'm sure there's many similarities, uh, you know, as far as Vietnam is concerned as well. But it's it's almost a case of of showing a face. Obviously, that will predominantly be done virtually. But where you can have face to face meetings, great. And um, relationship building and what we encourage university um, colleagues to do is kind of put calendar invites in the diary, you know, kind of ensure that, as, as Heike said, it's quite common, especially in a tertiary market, to kind of start relationships and then kind of really drop the ball because everyone's so busy. But in Latin America, you must dedicate the kind of resource to keep these um, these relationships going and then that will um, benefit institutions long term. Do you think it's better that they, you know, you have staff in country or is it best that, you know, you fly the faculty or relevant staff members in or is it a combination of the both? Yeah, it's a combination of both. And I and I think, you know, we were, I was, I was going to come, come to this a little bit later in the fact that, you know, representation at a local level is really important because it's kind of then it, there's an integrated approach. So it's almost like they're not separate parties. It's almost like you can have... The, the, the local representative, of course, undertaking a lot of work, a lot of kind of relationship building, a lot of obviously same cultural, uh, you know, cultural understanding, which is so important because there's many personally, you know, I've been involved in these kind of agreements and it can become quite frustrated having the kind of Western mindset and then trying to understand what's going on. And sometimes you need a bit of a calming influence at a local level. OK, this will happen. Just patience. And I've been told many a time, you know, just just uh, paciencia, which is you know, patience in Spanish and and it, and it will happen. So, but I think having that local representation is of course, incredibly important for many reasons. And especially if we look at the kind of, you know, difference in time zones as well and getting things signed the same, the same day. So, so yeah. Thanks yeah. Simon. And just a reminder to our, oh, sorry, Heike, did you want to add something? I was going to say, yeah, just, just to add on to that. I think that's right. I think, and what we always advise our clients um, when they're looking at, uh, at partnerships or even recruitment for that matter as well is that uh, you know having an in, in, in market rep is really important we'll talk about that a little bit later but um, actually it does need to be supplemented by uh, by you know the international team but also critically when you are looking at these partnerships uh, you know faculty does need to be present because they need to be building relationships with their counterparts offshore and it's really really hard to do that uh, virtually um, if I might just make one more point, I think um, I was just reading, as we all do, um, uh, the pie uh, earlier this weekend, there was an article about uh, the Sunway Lancaster partnership in Malaysia, and um, it really just sort of a hat tip, I think, to to Lancaster. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, the, the, the leap of faith they took 17 years ago when they set up with Sunway, which was not even a university at that point, it was a, it was a college. Uh, and you look at where they are now, you know, 6,000 students a year delivering full degrees and their ambition to grow in the future. I think that sort of is a really good lesson for other institutions that are thinking about how they can grow in, in the region and, and really understanding that right now, some of the partners you might work with may not be at the, at, at the same level or parity with, with you, but boy, boy, they're changing quickly and uh, they'll probably get there. So you know, sort of um, having that faith and investing for the long term, I think is really, really important. Thanks, Hiker, and good shout out. Um, I'll stick with you, Hiker, and, and your experience in the government's, government space. So how important is it for educational professionals to establish connections with government entities in Southeast Asia? And are there any strategies for eff effectively engaging with government bodies to na navigate the regulatory flame framework and policies, which can be quite complex across Southeast Asia. Yeah, thanks, Beck. Um, I think actually, uh, you know, I think actually the the level of engagement that you have with uh, government bodies in this region, again, really depends on what your objectives and what your approach is to the market. And so, like, just to draw a distinction, I think between uh, student recruitment, you know, sort of more retail student recruitment and uh, partnerships. If your if your focus is on student recruitment, uh, then actually often there's not really much reason to honestly to engage with local government uh, at all because uh, there's no need for you to do it. Um, the exception probably is uh, if you are interested in engaging with scholarship bodies, um, so local government scholarship bodies such as uh, you know the uh, 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 LPDP scholarship program in, in Indonesia, for example or Project 89 and 
uh, in, in Vietnam is another one, then, you know, obviously you want to be um, in front of uh, those bodies and, and uh, making your case as to why they should send students your way. But otherwise, um, day to day, there's probably not a huge reason to do it. Um, now, it's quite different if you are engaged in uh, deeper forms of transnational education, because then you are uh, involved and you need to meet uh, certain regulations uh, and you need to know uh, what those regulations are and you need to build relationships because you don't want to get to the point where your application arrives on the desk of an official and they've never heard of your university or your institution. So, so that situation is quite different. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think in terms of strategies and ways to sort of engage and deal with this, uh, for most institutions, uh, you know, I mean, excepting the ones like, you know, RMIT in Vietnam, for example, uh, or Monash in Indonesia now, or, you know, lots of the branch campuses in, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia or Singapore, um, you know, you've got uh, excellent support through uh, embassies and consulates. Um, they can open doors and really help to do those introductions for you. Uh, and again, you know, a shout out to uh, the Brits and to the Australians in particular, who I think do a great job of supporting their institutions in the region. Um, the second thing is, uh, you know, your local partners can help. So if you are involved in a T&E or a joint venture, which involves and requires some approval by the local authorities, uh, your local partner should be absolutely leading that and they, you should be supporting them, but uh, that should be their role. Uh, and then thirdly, of course, we can uh, support as well. We have good networks uh, through the region too, and, and we can help with those introductions. Thanks, Heike. Um, we did have a question that's come in from Rob, and he says, to what extent do governments in Southeast Asia and LATAM, Simon, if you can answer, readily sure. volunteer information on skills shortages and what's the best way to try and stay on top of this changing pictures across multiple countries in the region? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. And I suppose to answer that, it, it really is kind of devolved to each particular market because, you know, there's 33 countries. If you look at kind of Mexico downwards, it's, you know, there's a lot of diversity as far as, as countries within Latin America. So it's all about key stakeholders. It's all about communication. In Colombia, for example, we've done work with Colfoduro. We're in regular contact with them, so they would be able to provide information. We have similar contacts in, in other markets. And also what we found is, you know, in many cases, direct to the organization, but in some cases, agencies uh, and other stakeholders can have those relationships that are kind of recognized by the government so actually in Panama for example we've gone through a couple of educational agencies who have those day-to-day -day, um, contacts with the government and they're a recognized kind of provider of of, of information and disseminating and um, of course work together so so I yeah I I, I believe that it's um Staying up to date with the information is, of course, incredibly important. We've actually got a document which we provided on local opportunities and um, contacts, etc. So I, I'm more than happy to send that to you, Bex, afterwards, and then you can disseminate that. And I hope that's answered some of the questions because, of course, I could some of the question because, of course, I could continue to talk on on that one. Uh, yeah, shall I have I a go? Yeah, Rob, great Have question. Have a go. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I think, uh, you know, just, just as a sort of a general comment, I think um, the reason why it's such a great question is because uh, increasingly what we're seeing is we're just seeing a, a much sharper focus on ROI. Um, in other words, you know, families uh, in this region are really, really focused on, okay, what is it that we're going to get as a return from this large investment in international education? And so they're already sort of looking through uh, the, the education journey and looking at, okay, what is the, the professional opportunity that's going to arise from that? And obviously that is then determined by uh, labour market demands. Uh, to answer your question, I think, you know, and again, just maybe to, to, to answer uh, for Vietnam, which is the, the, the one that I'm most familiar with, it's actually really hard to get good information because um, A, it's in Vietnamese, and so it's not really accessible to... Uh, an international uh, audience um, and you know there are government statements and policies you know at the city level so Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi and Da Nang they have their own government priorities where they talk about the sectors that they're really looking try to try to promote 
Um, you also have government um, sectors, and um, for example, there are uh, 99 sectors which have been identified by the government as uh, you know sort of high potential and, and uh, particularly in high technology, uh, which is something that we'd be happy to share. Um, but actually, I think um, you know what what we're quite keen to do as we move forward with Acumen is is actually look more closely at this and look more closely at labour market uh, demand. Um, but just as one other sort of pointer, um, Rob, I think what's really interesting again is um, you know sometimes we dip into um, uh, salary surveys uh, in Vietnam, for example. So you look at the ADECOs and others of the world, and you look at salary surveys, and that's super interesting because where you can see the high salaries. Uh, is where there are talent shortages. And that then, of course, is going to catch the eye of um, families who are thinking about how they can get the most return for their buck. Um, so there's lots of different ways to kind of try and piece it together. But, um, you know, imagine that you've got one government agency that's going to sort of give you that information is is, is not really here, at least for, for Vietnam. Thanks for that, Heike. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, we look at some real good success stories. Um, so could you both share some real world examples um, of approaches in South Asia and Southeast Asia, sorry, Southeast Asia and Latin America? Um, Simon, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure, May. sure. Yeah, of course. And I'll summarise this in the interest of time, Bex. But I've, uh, honestly, you know, what I kind of understand is a good market approach. And again, um, successful examples, really, of institutions that have done well. It's about differentiation because Latin America is becoming ultra competitive. Most institutions around the world have this diversity mandate. Latin America is, is, is a really good um, diversity market. Why? Because students actually study a wide um, range of subjects they um, go to a you know wide range of institutions although there is a certain percentage of market that's ranking conscious not all students are ranking conscious so really there's a market for everyone but if i look at kind of successful strategies it is it is differentiation is the key what we often advise is um, look at kind of five key reasons. I mean, if, if you look, for example, an exhibition where there's, you know, 200 providers, it's actually quite difficult to, you know, it, it, to, to see what the differentiation is and what the kind of unique advantages of each institution are. So what we do is we ask institutions to kind of look at that and work out and communicate this in local language uh, as well, which Hike has already kind of alluded to is really important. So what are your five key benefits in Spanish of this particular institution, wherever it may be, and what's going to draw students and families into that institution, which is incredibly important. I'll, I'll make a second point, which is all about looking at kind of demand. There is a wide variety of demand across Latin America as far as courses and programs, but we actually undertook a survey, and, and again, I'm happy to send this out, as to what the, the key demands are as far as subject focus. And it's interesting because you've got the generic, you know, business, humanities, social sciences, but actually, there's new areas which Latin American students are going to study, sustainable, uh, sustainability, innovation, energy, you know, programs with a green element. So this is this is so, so what we encourage institutions to do is actually focus on some areas, focus on five distinct advantages of, of the institution, but also lead with a couple of programs. And in several markets across Latin America, if we look at Panama, for example, they have scholarship programs just in certain subject areas. So there, you know, that that would be, I, I mean, a couple of years ago there was a program in, in, in water engineering, for example, that students would go from Panama to, to institutions fully funded by the government. So you really have to, you can't just enter the market, Bex, just with this is us, this is this is why we're excellent. This is because you've got to have that differentiation. And 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 um without going over time, peer-to-peer. Um, recruitment is really important. So students, you know, again, we've noticed a big trend towards existing students communicating benefits of that institutions to new students because students don't really want to hear from us. They want to hear from students, you know, so. And, and Simon, you walk across, work across multiple different countries yes. in terms of where your clients are from. Are you seeing different tactics used from different countries or is it sort of consistent across, you know, each, you know, the, the UK, Australia, US? 
It's really interesting. It's it's a great question. And um, I, yeah, I mean, there's certain, I, I believe the approaches are slightly different in that there's certain markets that are kind of, I suppose, more aligned and more focused on agencies. Potentially the UK goes down this route and had good success. Um, other, you know, the Australian institutions, while they do use agencies, will use other stakeholders as well, uh, predominantly. And there's kind of there, there there are different approaches. The Canadians institutions have had great success dealing with the local embassy because what we found is during the pandemic actually, and um, Canada became really strong in Latin America and Canada institutions. Why? Because actually the Canadian embassy, more than embassies in the UK, Australia, more than, you know, the British Council stayed in touch with the stakeholders. And that made a real difference. And they showed they cared, put their arm around, you know, the local agencies. So that, that had a big impact. So there are different channels um, which which different countries use. And we, we can obviously advise on that further but it's a great question hmm. thanks simon and it is and hiker is that similar in terms of the different countries coming into southeast asia as well are you seeing their approach has been very similar or are they diverse and and give us some maybe examples like success success yeah yeah i think um yes obviously yeah there are some 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 big differences and um i think that that agent the way in which uh, institutions work with agents is is a is a key one, uh, you know, and and particularly um, the journey that some of the U.S. institutions are on uh, in terms of how they engage with agents and uh, how they make uh, success or commission payments is is really interesting compared to let's say Australia and the U.K. and others that are you know that's kind of bread and butter for them. Um, but I did just want to like in terms of some examples, I just kind of maybe sort of again. Uh, you know, without prejudice to anyone else, but just shout out a few a few institutions that I think are doing a, a good job and why they're doing a good job. I think um, in terms of the student recruitment side, I think, um, you know, uh, here in Vietnam, for example, I think Monash has done a good job. Um, Monash has invested in its people, it's, you know, it's had reps on the ground for a while. Um, they've also been really smart in terms of how they work with agents. And so, you know, they are um, investing in their agents and their relationships. And so, you know, some of their key agents, they're really going deep with. And um, and as a result, they're building really strong loyalty, um, not only with the counsellors, but also with the owners of the agencies too. Uh, they are supplementing that with, you know, generous scholarships um, and also looking at ways in which they can reduce, you know, sort of, I would say barriers to entry by looking at entry requirements and things like that while maintaining their quality standards. So, um, you know, they're not the only ones by any stretch, but, you know, they're, they're certainly one example of a, an institution, I think, that's, you know, savvy in terms of their approach to the market. Um, another example, um, just a slightly different one uh, in terms of branding, uh, Swinburne. Swinburne in Vietnam, 20 years ago, um, they started sponsoring this TV show called Road to Olympia. Uh, and it's uh, it's all about sort of the smartest math whiz in, in uh, high school level in, in Vietnam. And boy, I mean, I don't know how many millions of dollars of uh, free uh, advertising they've got from that over the years and how it's helped to establish them to become a household name in Vietnam. It's just amazing. And I think uh, the lesson there for institutions is sort of, uh, you know, again, just, you know, what Simon was saying before, if you want to diversify, uh, you know, sort of distinguish yourself from the competition, and if you want to be relevant uh, to the community, figure out a way to engage with the community and to support it. Uh, and, you know, doing these sorts of things such as competitions or supporting community initiatives is really, really good uh, and a really good way to, to build brand. Um, final example, I just want to, just on TNE, I just also just to say, um, uh, you know, much as I'd like to take credit for this one, uh, I haven't been involved in it, so full disclosure. But um, Waikato University in Vietnam has been doing a great job, and uh, they've been building a really important strategic partnership with National Economics University uh, in Vietnam. And, and the keys to their success are really, they're approaching it with this long-term commitment. And so, you know, their pricing is super, super reasonable, um, probably doing it at, at a loss. Uh, I don't know, but it's, you know, it's it's a very reasonable price point. 
Uh, and, you know, they're, they're doing this because they want to build reputation and build market share in, in terms of delivering in Vietnam. And the other key thing is, is that their senior leadership is in the market three times, four times a year, meeting with the stakeholders and meeting with everyone. And it's that sort of commitment that I think is really important if you want to grow a really powerful um, transnational education relationship in the region. Thanks, Haka. And, and lots of great ideas and tips and suggestions. And, and look, I'm um, very happy that you mentioned Monash and a shout out to Hua. I had the opportunity to work with her and she does an incredible job in the Vietnamese market. So um, kudos to her. Um, but as we're down to the last 10, 10 minutes, I think, um, can you give some actionable uh, insights or tips that you can offer our listeners um, as they expand their presence um, in both Southeast Asia and LATAM? Simon, let's start with you. Of, of course, thanks, Bex. And um, it's been a fascinating conversation. I think actionable kind of tips would be, first of all, local presence. It'd be remiss of me not to mention that and kind of look at, at the advantages as well. Obviously, the local cultural kind of similarities, the kind of time zones, um, you know, kind of having a representative almost 24 seven in contact with the market and then understanding kind of how the stakeholders work, as we've alluded to earlier, is just incredibly important, really. And um, that that is a trend that is kind of increasing um, across Latin America with lots of institutions deciding to kind of have a, a, a local representative, which has, as I've, um, as I've said, a whole host of advantages. And then going back to this peer to peer and looking a bit deeper at that as far as student ambassadors and having student ambassadors within your international office paid or unpaid. But, you know, having those kind of links between the students who are going, who are applying and the existing students is, is important. We've seen in, in some incredible blogs, TikTok videos kind of Instagram posts, which really give the students confidence, because as we're all aware, it's all about confidence that this institution is, is going to work for us. And that's that's so important. And of course, investing time in the market, because we often, I think a miss a miss um perception of Latin America is that it's it's it has to be, it's very much, you know, um scholarship focused and it, it that that's true to a certain extent but what you need to look at is the relative costs and then how much these families are investing in education which in relative terms is four or five times as much as we would be investing with our local currencies due to devalued currencies inflation economic issues so this, this is it's really important to kind of like dedicate resource and show care and, and and of course offer that kind of customer service um you know within latin america that you can do through local representatives so i i would say those are kind of i suppose actionable insights and and tips really and it's kind of if you don't have that resource in latin america then uh, of course just kind of allocate some of your budget to um to the development of the region and and also have realistic expectations because the institutions we work with that have those realistic expectations keep going they're in the market they're very they're satisfied they're very pleased with results but it's not another india it's not another china it's not another nigeria africa other markets but it is a really strong secondary stroke tertiary market and of course um with that investment of time you will see the rewards. Thanks, Simon. I think there's also back on on around your student ambassadors. There's you know some great platforms out there that have come around that that people can use. And yeah. UniBuddy, yeah. the ambassador platform, are, are terrific um, providers. So, um, Hiker, is there similar or differences that you can share with Southeast Asia? Yeah. Look, I think uh, I think yeah, the obvious one, which which uh, Simon's already mentioned, is um, you you need to be present. Uh, one way or another, uh, it's it's just you know the the competition landscape uh, in Southeast Asia is uh, you know is, there's a very a high degree of of competition uh, you know across most of the major markets these days, uh, particularly in places like Malaysia, uh, Vietnam. Uh, you know there is there is a huge amount of uh, in country representation, and so actually um, being here and and being able to um, compete is is really really important. 
Um, and I think the other thing as well is uh, doing it right is really important too. Like sometimes the temptation can be to say, oh, we're just going to appoint someone that we've met or whatever and, um, you know, we can do it for, you know, $20,000 cheaper or something like that, whatever. But but actually what we can see over time is that uh, often, sometimes it will work and it will work really well in terms of results. Other times it just doesn't because that person is just not under supervision. They don't really know necessarily what they should be doing and the institution is not able to support them. Um, and then that's without even talking about some of the compliance uh, issues, you know, again, for example, in Vietnam now, I mean, um, when you look at the complexity of, of labor law, social security, um, tax law, uh, and then you add in uh, personal data protection uh, uh, requirements, which have come in, uh, you know, it's really important to be across all that and not to have to worry about that, which is, you know, kind of often where a provider like Acumen would come in uh, and can really provide some important assurances for universities that are looking to be present uh, in the market. Um, I think the final thing is just, just just to kind of put people to be aware of is just that, you know, uh, it's a fast changing environment as I've sort of, you know, said at the start as well. Things are changing really, really quickly. And so, um, you know, sort of staying up to date, being aware of what's going on, um, and being able to respond to it is super important as well. So not just sort of setting your stall out and then thinking that what you've done the previous five or 10 years is going to carry you through for the next five to 10 years is super important. So checking your assumptions. Uh, and that's kind of what we've been doing a little bit recently with some of the reports that we've been putting out. Um, for example, our key trends report, which just came out uh, a few weeks back, um, which really highlights some of the trends and the changes that are happening in Southeast Asia that you know, people should be thinking about when they are engaging in, in these markets. Yeah, thanks, Hiker. And I think, you know, when we talk about how much the the student or the applicant is changing as well, we're seeing a big change of student behaviour over the last three years through COVID. You know, they're much more savvy in terms of doing their research and, you know, agents still fall or, or um, so other stakeholders are still an important part. Um, but the student is much more, you know, they've got everything at their finger, fingertips and able to find that information. Um, mm -hmm. I know we're right getting up towards the end of time, uh, but are you able to touch in terms just quickly on the type of investment that, you know, a, an institution may want to make in your regions and, and to, to expect something? So Alex, talking about commercials here um, and real sort of dollar figures, is there any sort of gauge to give an idea if someone was starting out in those markets, how much they should be investing? Do you want to go first, Heiko? Or... <laughs> mm. I was hoping you would go first and then I can um, I can uh, offer a lower number than you were, than you were going to say. Um, uh... <laughs> um, no, I can I can go first, I guess. I think, um, you know, the first thing is is there are two aspects to uh, to investing in, in the market. One is obviously the, the cost of the the person in the management service, if you're working with someone like Acumen or with Educo or whatever. And then the second part is the marketing and the operations budget. Uh, and that's the, sort of the oil that you need uh, to, once you have someone in the market supporting you, for them to be able to travel and to uh, attend fairs and to engage actually uh, on your behalf. So there are those two distinct um, elements to it. Um, and, you know, sort of just as a, as a rough guide, um, you're probably looking at around um, $65,000 a year, uh, uh, US, roughly speaking, uh, to have like a fully compliant, uh, well-trained, um, well-recruited, well-supported resource uh, in the markets in, in Southeast Asia. That will vary a little bit depending on the level of experience that you're looking for, but that will give you some sort of picture. And that, 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 that's great, Heiko. And we, and, and you know, the, the figures are reasonably similar in Latin America, but what we have is a kind of, we have a couple of projects. So we have the market engagement type projects, which will be six month projects. And they start from around 20,000 US, but then to have a fully engaged kind of dedicated uh, regional representative would be a similar sort of price, uh, as, uh, you know, to, to what you've just stated. But also looking at the advantages quickly, because it's we you've got as as um you know, Sanam have it's it's almost that ecosystem, and it's and 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 a point that really resonated with me, Hiker, is that many institutions are 
you know, recruiting direct and putting kind of members of staff in, but then actually they haven't got that support system. They haven't really got maybe the stakeholder network the engagement that you have with a with a team, as as in Acumen and and Edco. So that makes a large difference. And if you do have to invest slightly more money, then that will come back as a return on investment. So, so thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Mm. No worries. Well, I haven't had any more questions come through and we have just hit time. So I'd like to thank you both, Simon and Heike, for 45 minutes of your minds. Um, and hopefully our audience um, have enjoyed today's session. So thank you very much. And everyone will send out a recording and hopefully get to watch it again. Thanks, Thanks very so much, much, guys. Take Thanks. care. Bye. See ya. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thanks, Bix. Thanks.